I'm your host, Soli, and here we are for another groovy time. The optimist herself who preaches such on the Happiest Said Person podcast. And yes, I've heard. It's a fun, fun show. Uh, as real as it gets, Alessandra Jacobs is back, back in action. Thanks for having me. Always a good time. Anytime. Uh, so uh, we, we were just talking about back and forth uh, when we first networked, just a few different movies and shows. And I was just like, hey, you know what? Here's a show we could revisit. We could just talk about our favorite moments from the one, the only David E. Kelly legal comedy that is Boston Legal in his Boston verse. <laughs> Who would have thought? I know. I <laughs> it's such a good show and i haven't revisited it in a while so it was nice to come back to it because i don't know it's something about those i don't know what the magic was but like the year 2003 to like 2009 10 for tv shows were just immaculate like it was west wing boston legal house um there were some other random like short one season shows that i watched as well I don't know if it was because Bush was in office and we were all just like trying to make yep. like good content, but I don't know. What's, what's your take on that? I, I think it's very much, it was bound to happen one way or another. It's just like, I think once we got to the two thousands, people got their head out of, you know what, and just started paying more attention now, I guess. <laughs> and the show is still just referenced here and there. And it's not just of any of the actors or anything uh, like, there was like uh during some of the Trump hearings, someone took a Boston legal clip where someone set someone on fire and they did some Photoshop and everything. I was like, see, <laughs> people are actually listening and seeing how fiction mirrors reality. <laughs> Even though it's I missed that. I'm so bummed. <laughs> yeah. I tried looking for the clip. I don't know if someone pulled it or what, but I was just like, see, hats off to anyone who made time for that. <laughs> Well, I think it hit on like every major issue at the moment. Like they, it really was a show that they had their spin. They had more of a, a leftist take, but they still had Denny Crane, who was like the more like Reagan conservative who kind of like provided the opposite or like the antagonistic side. So it was like just every issue you could think of, death penalty, abortion, um, war, it hit everything, but it did it in such a genuine, real way. And I was and just it, the writing it was in on the joke, you know, like I yeah, wasn't as met... well, and I wasn't really into All in the Family or uh, what's the other one, Married with Children. I know kudos to those who do find it entertaining, but at the same time, they were in on the joke. I think I just got turned off because, kind of like Rick and Morty, it was attracting a lot of actual toxic people who were like, "My icon," and like, uh, "Dude, you're not." You don't get the chuck. <laughs> and I'm I sure any show that go, go ahead. Oh no, sorry. And I'm sure no. I'm sure uh, but I'm sure there's someone out there who wants to be a Denny Crane. And that's you don't want to be like Denny Crane. <laughs> True. I he sort of I don't want to make this comparison, but I can't help it because <laughs> you said that. He's sort of like maybe what Trump thinks he is. He probably Denny is. Crane's sort of <laughs> Yeah, competent. Um, obviously, Star Trek. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Star Trek is like in his past and obviously in the real world, but he has that like, I don't know, like more of a debonair feeling. And so it's almost like watching the trajectory of politics and sort of how Denny Crane is more oh traditional God. conservative. Yes. It's like, yeah, oh, Trump thinks he's this guy. But he's really a buffoon because he's never in on his own shtick. It's it's mm -hmm. above him. So I was like rewatching it. There's like so many layers to it now. And there's like a sadness to it because it's like you want to go back to that world. <laughs> yeah. oh I just God. I don't know. It's so rewatching bits and pieces of it. I'm like, it's so relevant to today. It's just spooky. Uh, and the DVDs were so packed with so many special features. Uh, I know I resaw it all the way through about three years ago and i still am going to introduce people to it it's still on hulu and amazon for those who want uh and but i it, it very much so is kind of just i mean just that conversation i think they have in like either season one or two and like they just have a speech where they explain themselves and you pretty much get the whole thing that like 
Alan is just self-loathing. He's just like, I I really don't know why I do this anymore. Other than that, I can, it's just a no-brainer. I can do it. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I can destroy someone's life. I'm a monster. And and yeah, Denny is the total just, I'm a proud American and fuck you. You know, he's basically saying without realizing he's saying it. And it's like, well, okay. <laughs> I don't know what you expect to gain from this, but you do you, boomer. <laughs> But yeah, it's like, well, yeah, that perfect generational divide because they are, because what James, James Spader in, is in his early mid sixties and what, um, William Shatner's what 90 something. So there's like, <laughs> which is crazy. He just went to space. Um, <laughs> and he's like sharp as attack because ironically he's has, um, a dementia or alzheimer's early onset alzheimer's in the show and it's like meanwhile he's like doing so well in real life but it's he like that is perfect shameless but even he is yep. aware of his bullshit that he starts up once in a while that's just how much free time that man has <laughs> i yeah i just and it remind watching again re-watching because it's sometimes I, I rarely totally rewatch things or come back to things. I sort of keep it in like my nostalgia brain, but um, it just reminded me of how good that just the actors are like that era of acting and that caliber. And even like the guest stars, everyone that came through was so just involved in the show. Everyone was giving, giving their best acting. And I just feel like you don't see that anymore for TV. Yeah, like Mark everyone Valley like kind of went back to being tough guy guys, but he was perfect for the hotshot guy there. Uh, Julia Bowen before you know Claire on Modern Family, <laughs> it's a perfect just kind of yeah, like, just dry reactions. It's like, oh. you know, it's like you need the straight person to react to all the crazy people in the office. Yeah, and even like I feel like um, who was it in the first season? Monica Potter. Yeah, she the street character right so she did this so, and, saw like, and kind of vanished i'm like what happened did she just give up acting <laughs> didn't she was she in oh what's that show was she in parenthood or am i thinking of somebody else let me see it might be rebecca de mornay i think was on there uh, yep no you're right okay well, well okay <laughs> stand okay. corrected so she was on parenthood <laughs> and i you know what's funny is i've only i've never really seen the show but i just remember being like oh where did she go and then she went on that show but oh, i feel like corrected. they even okay so then she's what? on goliath the other david e kelly legal drama <laughs> so once you're part oh, of his family that? uh that, that's the billy bob thornton amazon show yeah 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 okay where he's just getting I... rid of his vices it's got all other kinds of actors on it like tanya raymond and william hurd and lou diamond phillips <laughs> Oh wow! So he, yeah, he really collects the, um, the OGs. <laughs> he gets everybody from the indie darlings. Like, I mean, he did it on Big Little Lies as well, where you're like, "Oh, that guy! Oh, that person who's in that Sundance favorite! Oh my God, never seen you crush my soul so well." <laughs> I and I and I feel like too that era of TV was like the showrunner era, where it was like the showrunner, the right whoever it was, was as famous as the people on the show and and like almost like that the the follow through from like the Seinfeld Larry David like you know their their entity in and of themselves like that David E. Kelly Aaron Sorkin that that like personality type and again I feel like we don't have like showrunners like that anymore and I feel like that's half the battle is really having somebody that's like in charge and making all the pieces move together and has like one cohesive vision. Yeah, uh, uh, it's definitely a precise. And I wish more right. I mean, I'm hoping post Writers Guild, you know, finally solving their issues that every writer's room is like detoxified because it seems like for a while you would hear so many horror stories about people not getting along, quitting, or just refusing to agree on a vision. And it seemed like, like you say, like, this came out the same year as The Office, and it seemed like everyone had a pretty good experience. But then, you know, post Sopranos, Mad Men, you would hear every once in a while horror stories about, you know, directors walking off sets or producers refusing to, uh, you know, 
have certain uh narratives and certain scripts they directed and so it's like it to to have this precise vision where people are agreeing on the same language the same style is like see that that's how you do it that <laughs> everyone agreed i mean shatner even has a Denny has a Star Trek ringtone at one point when he's being arrested, <laughs> uh, mistakenly smuggling drugs. And I just thought that was perfect. It was like, see, that that if this doesn't, rem- if the viewer doesn't get this by this point, then, you know, no one can help you. you know? <laughs> I've never but that's what ha- made it so Sorry. layered and smart. And two, the music. That's the other thing that I forgot too. Again, rewatching, I was like, Oh my God, the intro music, first of all, is iconic. And the carry through of like song choice and like layering, like they'll use a song at the beginning and then they'll yeah. bring it through to the club. It's like, bow, it, I don't bow. know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And it's, it's like, um, like a dance and, you know, I'm a writer. So I like to me and I love music. And so to me, writing is to is music to me like it it has to flow it has to have a rhythm it either has to be staccato you know if you're doing a monologue or it has mm-hmm. to you know be a little more melodic if you're you know working with a few characters and it's like you can feel the energy like almost like through the writing connected to the music and I was like oh this is why I love this show so much as a kid and I couldn't quite place it because when I was growing up um and then I thought I was going to go to law school and I thought I was going to be a lawyer because of the show and it's funny because I realized I didn't want to go to law school I wanted to be a writer I wanted to write Alan Shore's monologues oh, and I was lovely. like how did I <laughs> yeah, connect that as a like growing up it was because I never saw anyone in the entertainment world or doing that so I never my brain never thought oh somebody had to write the show somebody had to make the show <laughs> I thought it just appeared on the planet yeah, they didn't get there overnight either. <laughs> but it, it's very eye-opening, though, too, because you're just like, "Whoa, okay," you know. And, and the fact that you know someone had to read that aloud. Uh, I did see an interview with Craig Turk, who has done everything. He wrote for The Good Wife. He was a John McCain speechwriter. <laughs> he was the co-creator of the FBI shows, and he talked about. When he was being schooled by David E. Kelly on there, he would just make a little small changes here and there, not take credit for it, but he would just like here and there, and he and then he'd you know play it back, and he's like, yeah, that that change does actually make this flow better. And so, I I, th- I think it does complement your point. It does seem like everyone legit got on the same page, had the gentle criticism, and constructive environment without refusing each other. You know, it, it seemed like writers' rooms. Those late '90s, early 2000s ones were pretty good at just pretty much just saying, "Hey, if you're going to do this, you you better be on that pedestal, and you better be ready to pitch. And if we don't buy your pitch, then you better word it a different way instead of, you know, just throwing a temper tantrum saying, "Why don't you like my idea?" You know. <laughs> yeah, there was more of a cutthroat. <laughs> Even when you listen to interviews of like actors and writers, there was more of like a cutthroat energy. Like everyone, I think, was a little bit more, a little more kind of like brutally ambitious, which I connect with because I'm a little bit more like harsh in that way. Um, whereas now I feel like it's a little, I don't know, kumbaya sometimes. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Yeah. And everyone's a little like sweet and cute and like we all have to, you know, get along. And I'm like, no, ruthlessness um it makes things happen it gives an energy i think like everyone has to vibe and be on the same page but i think like a little Bingo. bickering a little bit of, yeah unsavoriness that's what makes a show good you know there's like um this joke that um any type of food like any type of um cuisine where it comes from a place of conflict has really <laughs> good food yes. american traditional food is bland as can be because we don't really have like that that energy, that spice. And so I don't know, I'm like a little bit of an instigator debater. So I'm like, yeah, you need a little bit of that, that oomph, that energy, <laughs> that, uh, that like anything goes in comedy. Bingo. And I, I love how yeah. all the interns have their own, you know, unusual quirks, whether it's unusual flirtations versus just 
one of them's a cross dresser one of them's also just like pretty much just takes everything out of context but i, I love how i mean the uh, if anything, the staging of this is perfect. And staging is something I wish I had learned in film school, but no one had the decency to teach me that until I took a master class taught by, you know, Ron Howard on that master class site. And it's like, see, but that's everything. <laughs> Where are you in proportion to the camera? What are you doing in the scene? Uh, does this physical yeah. gag work versus how you deliver that, again, that monologue? <laughs> like, I, I wish that had been more of a thing instead of just rehearsing and just lucking out with whatever landed in the, in the can. <laughs> yeah. I'd be curious to see, um, Bloopers. <laughs> I, yeah, the scene where, um, Alan Shore is meeting with all of the Chinese executives and he brings them all in and he bows to each one. Um, and then ever all of the partners are sitting behind him. He's giving this amazing monologue. And he turns to the, you know, the Shirley Schmidt and everyone in a line and goes, okay, gang, smile. <laughs> and to have that whole I was so curious to see if it was like a Hail Mary, like if he just had to know all of it and did it in a take, or how much prep and like, like you said, with the camera work and set and making everything work so well, if it was like an all-day shoot. <laughs> because I would, I wonder if that's like in the behind the scenes, because watching that, I'm like to make that work and to have everything be visually apparent is like such a feat. And I don't know if, because everything's about money now making TV, I wonder if that would even be an option anymore to write. Obviously they still make scenes like that, but to to take your time to create that that feeling to have all the characters together, you know what I mean? To film everything simultaneously. I don't know if that, that would happen the it way that it, 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 yeah. It would have it's to a be bummer. on a already established franchise, probably like a horror anthology or sci-fi epic show. That's probably on like sugarcoated a bit, I guess, disguise it. Cause I mean, Star Trek strange new worlds had one that was on war criminals but that's always been a thing with the franchise. Uh, Hillary Swank did a show based on actual cold cases called Alaska Daily. And unfortunately, ABC canceled it. So yeah, I think uh, I think very much like the the Santos, uh, the Jimmy Smith and Alan Alda live debate on the West Wing. I, I think you're right. I think no one could do that now. It's just people don't have the patience. People don't have the same format anymore. Everyone is a little mechanical again even on streaming people want it like a year in advance and to sit on it before they upload it <laughs> it's just like i guess it just goes back to insecurity i guess <laughs> yeah it's a bummer well it's all going but i know it goes back to money i know jessica lang recently came out with an interview saying she plans on retiring soon because tv is no longer in movies what it used to be it's just a money-making business it's just franchises superhero mm -hmm. movies um and there's nothing th there's no money going into things that are worthwhile or unique it's, it's just obviously this is a business but it's not becoming it's not a melding of business and creativity it's just business now and yep. that was a bummer hearing that i'm like oh my god jessica lang like she revolutionized sort of like older women on tv with american horror story like she opened so many new doors for new characters. I'm like, is this kind of like the end unless you're remaking CSI or Magnum PI for the millionth oh, time? Those were or... so bad. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I, and I'm, yeah, I'm not a um, modern TV watcher. I'm someone that rewatches older shows or I've never, this is embarrassing. I've never seen The Sopranos and my brother is Fine. mortified and ashamed. And, but like, because I love like mafia culture and so I'm like re-watching that stuff because I feel like I missed out I don't know how I never just watched these things well to be fair I mean every show kind of finds its trance I mean I'm seeing people who are discovered stuff from 20 years ago also I, I did revisit some of Sopranos and I was like yeah I can see why that final season just is pretty hated but I mean uh I think the other thing is everything is like a variation of one half the same coin mm -hmm. like uh lovecraft country was a big show but 
uh, I think a lot of people missed it, and it's a shame because I think it was kind of a fun callback to early HBO, like stuff like Oz or uh, what's the other one, Tells from the Crypt, where you're having all this social commentary on, but a bit of an anthology as well, a new person every day, uh, put on trial kind of, and looking at the world for their toxic eyes and understanding how they got to this awful place. Uh, but and when you put it in 1950s Jonestown, it's even more terrifying. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I think uh, everyone also, going back to actors, brought up Jessica Lange. That That is a perfect example of people kind of want to imitate each other. And it's so easy to run into people who are kind of snobbing, like, oh, so-and-so is a good actor. How can you not see? I'm like, well, have you seen anything else they've done? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, yeah. seen them in that one role. I'm like, okay. <laughs> they might be bad in these other roles, but they finally found their bread and butter. <laughs> I don't know. And it's just a flash in the in the pan. It's like a moment in time. Like to me, <laughs> Austin Legal was like just right time, right place, right people, right casting. Whoever I didn't look up who the casting director was for this, but like just every um even like the judges, like what's her name? Um, Roma Mafia, who was on Nip Talk, which, yes. which is another show I love. Yep. He was such a good, like a judge rule is such like, now that's just like a throwaway rule um, where it's just like, oh, who cares? They're the judge, doesn't matter. But every <laughs> judge in this se- series in the show was just like, had a personality, had an energy. Um, Alan and what's her name? Gloria, their affair. And she was like a multi Oh, yeah, Gail O'Grady, yeah, <laughs> TV yes. favorite. And then Armin Shimmerman was their voice actor. There's a track guy. Um, the judges also the are the... The, 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 the Oh, uh... The short guy. You know who I mean. Um, what was his name? Shoot. Deborah Mooney, and then there was... There was a few other who they brought who had previously played those same roles on the practice and uh, Ali McBill. But... Oh, oh, the Reverend. Betty White. Yeah, Betty White was, oh my God, that was perfect casting there. Um, uh, the Reverend guy was Woody from uh, Psych, Kurt Fuller. <laughs> oh. The perv in the office. And I'm like, see, that was perfect casting there. Uh, but I, I just loved even just the opposing attorneys. Because half the time they were actors who you typically see being bad guy roles, and they're playing against types saying, I'm just trying to, you know, be a civil rights guy. Uh, yeah. And you're doing kabuki theater here. What, what's going on? <laughs> um, it reminds a- me of the early, the early seasons of Law and Order SVU, where they had every good actor before they became big. And like you can rewatch those episodes and be like, oh my god, Sarah Paulson, look who that is! Like, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like every random actor where you're like, how how is this possible? It's like whoever was paying attention and casting was really invested in their job, and that just shows. I think we take for granted, like you said, like set design, set movement, casting is like such an important thing, and you have to have. I think two. I like how the sh- the characters are. There are older characters. Like Candace Bergen is was older on that show. That, and they, I couldn't imagine this without Candy. <laughs> she, yeah, she was just oh, and her and William Shatner in Miss Congeniality. Like yeah. it felt like somehow an alternate world where like if everything worked out like, here mentally, yes. it was like the, I don't know. That's my sick brain twisting a new story into that fan fiction. Um. Absolutely. But yeah, Sterling I K. Like Brown how like, as that guy on Death yes. Row. And one of the de- one yeah. of the interns who was on the show for like the first two seasons ended up being his wife in real life. I'm like, that's awesome. Uh, my favorite. Yeah. What's his? Sorry, go, go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, do you remember the one with Aisha Tyler? Yes. But what was remi- I remember her being on there. Uh, what she, was uh, her? Well, just the way that whole episode was filmed was just jaw dropping because like she she is seeing through Alan's tricks. But the camera, uh, this is back when they got a little even more experimental with the courtroom scenes and have there being a lot of tracking shots. And then someone else comes into the nonstop tracking and, and just and she's just like, 
I think we can mature a little if we really want to get to the bottom of this. And of course, she doesn't win, but her point's been made. It's like, it just illustrates that Alan's the bigger dick this particular week. And it's just, it was just kind of riveting because it did actually make you focus on the topic that time instead of what mischief are they going to get into in this particular courtroom. Uh, and, but there is one that I think if every teacher should probably show people now, if they want to even talk about the current state of teaching, uh, Michelle Forbes, who you might know from uh, Homicide, Star Trek, uh, True Blood, and 24. Mm. Uh, she She was on one where she was talking about, you know, Planned Parenthood and uh, basically religious families who don't want certain stuff taught in school. And she's just pretty much just like, hey, you, know, you can't tell the teacher what not to teach. You know, it's you know, we're supposed to be neutral, just like the news. You know? <laughs> and yeah, and I, they did. All of those issues were done so well. And they, they handled things like Christianity, um, like oh, yeah. the homeschool the epa the fda they had their like more like over overture of morality and sort of like trying to be the teacher while also still playing the other side and like also kind of making the other side stupid but not being cruel about it mm -hmm. it was this really delicate way of doing it and um it reminds me I, the sherry o'terry episode where she's dumb <laughs> she's like a he voted for McCain because of Sarah Palin and yes the, oh my god and interviewed and it was like watching something from last week it was like watching a discussion about politics now and it's like to me I was like oh if anyone like watches something rewatches from from uh the show it's that episode because it like what predicted the future and is such a good way of calling somebody dumb without being cruel. Like <laughs> yes. it's just a very plain, like she's dumb. She's I'm almost putting a you on the in spot on without destroying your entire family. I'm um, giving you a chance for to insert some credibility, but I know that I know we're beyond that because you have no credibility. <laughs> yeah. And only it, Sherry O'Terry could play that role so well because she is in on it but then also plays dumb but i don't know it's own again casting just anyone else it would have come across as like you're making fun of somebody simple yeah but she's plays it so well and she's like so hypocritical and likable you're like oh yeah of course uh, yeah you you don't like her and you don't want to be the uninformed voter like her absolutely and in a way, she's kind of saying the other stuff that Denny already says on a regular basis, where he's like, oh, I just like his posture. I'm going to vote for him. It's like, but he doesn't even agree with you on this and that. Eh, I don't know. I like his tie. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> and uh, the fact that both Denny and Alan get married at the end, I thought was just brilliant. I was like, see, they're the only two fuckers who can stand each other. <laughs> there's something so beautifully magical about I magical. Love shows that it's almost like the same gender heterosexual people are like the relationship they're the love affair of course they would get married at the end because marriage if anything is like a partnership between two people that like each other human beings that are Bingo. friends <laughs> so I'm like yeah of course anyone else like alan could have gotten married to so many different women but yes. he you know what I mean but of course of course the two of them would end up together even <laughs> in this hypothetical not real relationship and then to have Justice Scalia you know being the guy marrying them <laughs> let's see you know I, I don't think any of us can get behind Scalia I'm sure he meant well but just his hot takes and just being very hard on certain races and crime I and then have him be just again the most hardened guy, a you know. I obviously it's an actor playing him, but it's just I thought that was just the icing on the cake. It's like let's take the most harsh person who's probably not the most progressive, and uh, get these two knuckleheads married. And it's not even about you know. Obviously they're not going to have sex with each other, but they love they legit love each other. They. They can't stand to not be around without each other and smoke a few cigars and talk life stories. 
Yeah, because it's almost like they are, <laughs> they make up one complete person. You know, like you said, Alan's um, self-loathing and Denny's oblivious. But you put these <laughs> people together and you have a fully enlightened human being. But of, of course, separate, they're like two little f- souls that are struggling. So it's almost like this, I don't know, I'm an existentialist. I'm like, oh, it's this beautiful existential <laughs> coming together of like someone finding themselves. But really, it's two people becoming like a fully fledged human being and I don't know anytime um they're very free like you say (laughs) yeah anytime a show does something so well done but also like subtle like that I'm like oh I get I get jealous of good writing and like good storytelling (laughs) like when I'm like jealous I'm like that's not fair I want to come up with that idea and (laughs) how why do you get to be profound and uh, we get to have a shitty script (laughs) why don't i get to tell that story in this lifetime and say it in such a (laughs) lovely way it's not fair it's like yeah me being a whiny little baby but it like (laughs) step up and be a better writer i'm like oh now i need to take this idea flip it on its head do it in another way and reinvent the wheel but obviously make it cooler and (laughs) am i saying i would ever be at the level of like a david e kelly no would i like to and aspire to of course but that's what we all want to be like the masters a master yeah (laughs) Well, and I, I definitely think these these characters could even probably exist in the same universe as the West Wing in a way, because like they are talking about just oh, it's like go ahead. Yeah, it's West Wing with humor. It's like a <laughs> satirical West Wing, like a added layer of like a, a meta commentary. Because they did it with a uh, Paul Redford at West Wing did work on some other shows like Designated Survivor and Madam Secretary, but they kind of. Like you say, they still had to play it safe. Like Madam Secretary kind of was on a Sunday where people are kind of wanting lazy inter- laid back, semi safe to air entertainment. And Designated was kind of during their thrill a thon, you know? And so they have a giant, you know, end of the disaster thing and then have all these wonderful actors, you know, having a meltdown while they're crying over, you know, abortions and Latino rights and exploitation of children in real life. And you're like, well, shit. So again, you got to put up all these barriers just to get to the goodies. And it's like, see, but not everyone, unfortunately, has all that patience to get to the icing on the cake. <laughs> uh, and I, I think it's going to get Sorry, one dimensional. Sorry, because it's like, yeah, designated, designated Survivor was so, because I remember when that came out, I was intrigued. And it was so like, like thrill, like thriller energy. And I'm like, it needs some juxtaposition it needs some nuance yeah and there was the like um what's it called uh, will and grace like leaned into like mm. the hyper comedy the camp oh but yeah. then also the real so i don't know why that came to my brain but it's in the wrong around the same era well no and it same, was like same kind of deal uh, i mean that show i can't imagine any uh the world of sitcoms without without that one because like that was one of the few who which it wasn't even about every other sitcom was kind of see what they got away with that the kid went over the kids' heads. They were kind of more, here's how we live, here's how we bitch and moan and argue, and here's how we're the only knuckleheads who can get along with each other. And uh James Burroughs, he, he is the king of staging. He actually released a book recently on how he helmed all these different sitcoms and directed every episode of that show. And I'm kind of worried with the other sitcoms they're bringing back because I'm like, see but they were made in a different time and that guy who played that what character is kind of an ass sorry go ahead what are they what else are they bringing back oh they're bringing fraser back this year and i'm oh i and forgot I, about that. yeah and even though it's some of the same people i'm like if you don't have daphne or niles what's the point <laughs> and you know it's just going to be checking the boxes like um Bingo. i'm all for representation but like you can't you can't make it feel like a quota it has to feel yes. like real and natural and like human beings that would come together like i think boston legal does it so well where they had um jerry espenson who was had tics and autism and it felt real mixed with someone like katie british two people that should not be remotely together oh she was a total scene still uh, and just bringing her british culture in to talk about this and you're like whoa that's awesome (laughs) yeah and she had those like um 
oh what was it her monologue she does on um about the um, environment and the water bottle calling out the hypocrisy of the oh. not the epa but running whoever was running that environmental organization it was like and, nestle and, or somebody but yeah there was some other lobbyist who had gotten on like the board which should be making sure we're drinking good water <laughs> God damn it oh yeah and the whatever line was where she was like um she asked what car he drove and he's like a hybrid all smug and she goes Ooh, and I was like that like little like sigh like that little it was just ugh, perfect and you could tell that was <laughs> her and not the script because like when it, in a script you really wouldn't have that reaction written in usually so yeah, I was like there was probably like some beat yeah. or maybe it was written as so and so rolls their eyes or reacts and they changed it up how about they just she bemoans the fact that no one is listening to her on this important topic and she's back to square one Ugh. yeah and the end she goes on this diatribe about um <laughs> the cobalt or nickel batteries and cars and how it's mined and you Some know all really that okay. is polluting our environment and if anything i mean i'm sure they wanted something timeless that wasn't going to just be a show that's rerun 24 7 on you know a and e they wanted something that was kind of make you comfortable talking about we'll return after these messages the jacked up review show podcast is honored to be part of the blind knowledge podcast network join anytime talk the talk and enjoy yourselves there's something enlightening for everyone with this crowd of cool cats check them out Hey, it's Brent Pope, the host of Breakfast with Brent Pope. You've seen me on some of your favorite TV shows saying things like, give it up, Jimmy. You got to sink this putt to win. On Breakfast with Brent Pope, I sit down with guests from the entertainment world, and we do it all over breakfast. Or should I say breakfast? Every week on Breakfast, you get inside Hollywood info and tips, great breakfast wrecks and booty debates. Most of all, you get the most delightful 30 minutes of your week. So dig in. It's breakfast time. Listen at breakfast.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Do you ever find yourself thinking about who would win in a fight between Goku and Superman? Hi, I'm James Gavsey, and on the Who Would Win show, me and my co-host Ray ignore anything important happening in the outside world and debate fictional battles between characters from comics, movies, and video games. We got a new show every week, and almost always am I the winner. (laughs) Yeah, not true, Ray. In the past, we've discussed such matches as Captain America vs. Darth Vader, Solid Snake vs. the Iron Giant, classic matchups like RoboCop vs. Terminator, and even the Muppets vs. Sesame Street. That one was crazy. So if you're a fan of geek culture and love a spirited debate, check out the Who Would Win Show wherever you get your podcasts, or check us out at whowouldwinshow.com. Uncomfortable subjects that still impact us. Yeah, and I think it's because the courtroom concept is the perfect way of showing every side. So it's almost like built into the the format where it's like yeah you get every sign and that side and then you get the judge who's the mediator and then you get the person that's being um cross-examined and you have sometimes the jury or the supreme (laughs) court representing the government so you have this built-in like human experience that's already in in the system um and you have the other layer of like the interpersonal drama in the office so it's like you get the full range of experience just built into the format (laughs) And it's just oh, like the, you have to play. Oh, the time where they go to Texas in the final six. <laughs> and Denny takes out a gun just to make a point about the other guys talking about gun control. I thought that was just brilliant because I even wonder if that would happen in real life. <laughs> and even if it couldn't, oh. you know, I could see some similarly absurd thing happening. And I love how the judge is like, let's just get a continuance. This got heated. <laughs> Well, there's like, I think it was some stat where it's like, uh, what, then he's been shot like four times or something. Yeah, the, yeah, because he says racist shit and people shoot him in retaliation for the fuck up shit. And then says. in like the <laughs> uh, first couple episodes, he's having an affair with one of his client's wives and then he pulls a gun on him in like one of the first couple episodes. And I'm like, this is already how the show is opening. Like, I love how they opened hard for this show because obviously they were spinning from another show. So they had some some like 
you know, clout already. So they could really go in on it. But the Crisis first episode is very dark. But yeah, it doesn't become a comedy until like that final season. And, you know, Ally McBill's another one where it's like it's uh, it's a like it or hate it. But it was kind of I think that's what it made Kelly realize I do need more just uncanny workplace behavior. I want to be like L.A. Law, but I want to avoid how formulaic it became years later. where <laughs> You're either interested that's, in yeah. plot A or plot B but not the whole thing. And Boston Lego, you really are invested in the whole thing without feeling like, okay, they're getting too comfy. <laughs> they're, they're, Cause you really are. The case will be just something where it's just like, it doesn't even feel like a case. It's like, yeah, it's a pretty big topical thing. I don't even know how I feel about that. I'm wondering where this is going to go instead of jinkies. I solved the case. <laughs> but that's what makes it good is it's, there's no, there's i mean obviously the case either you win or you lose but then it doesn't end it ends with alan um and denny smoking cigars and drinking yeah. on the balcony where they're musing about the case so it still ends open so it's like you're still allowed to make up your mind or not make up your mind mm -hmm. and that's like i wish a new show would do something like that obviously you don't want to copy because yeah, you know, then it would ruin the specialness. But there mm -hmm. needs to be some like some music, some uncertainty in modern TV. Like everything feels. Have you seen the show Chicago Med? Yes. Uh, I, I watch all the Tom Fontana, St. Elsewhere, Dick Wolf shows. But don't get me wrong, there are some okay. weaker ones, and there are some <laughs> ones I do recommend. I mean, you feel good when you watch an FBI episode because it's like Criminal Minds, where it's just very gruesome serial killers and white supremacists, and sometimes they get their comeuppance, and sometimes you don't get any comeuppance. And yeah, uh, the Chicago shows are an interesting bag. I'm really keen on Chicago Fire because I think that does a good mix of politics and gritty crime. PD's kind of formulaic, and Med's kind of trying to be kind of like Chicago Hope, but some people I know drive the viewer crazy. So uh, what, what's your take on it? You know, I, it's just funny. It's for whatever reason, my YouTube algorithm has been suggesting me clips from Chicago men. And I don't what? know why, because I don't, yeah, I follow down the weirdest algorithms. So I'll watch uh -huh. these little clips. So I feel like I've seen most of this show, but <laughs> like, so taken from the headlines like law and order svu to the point of like being comically ripped from the headlines mm -hmm. that it takes you out of the 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 zeitgeist feeling of it it doesn't feel like it's of the time it feels like it's like you know it would be like if they did an episode not about like safety or something but if they did one where like it was an exact replica of the titanic sub bursting yeah um, How, they don't always get it right sometimes yeah. Uh, sometimes it's just like okay this is a fun topic but you needed to maybe disguise it a little more so it didn't feel so blatant <laughs> and sometimes yeah, it's, like the it's them angrily responding to it I, I don't know how much of it is filtered <laughs> but they can use a little yeah more I'd, be, I'd, I'd be curious to see like who's in charge of pulling stories or like i wonder how that that research is versus who writes it <laughs> Yeah, or if it's both. Yeah, because I because whoever was writing and researching and doing you know that kind of monotonous work for Boston Legal, they made it relevant. Like it was you know the um, what was it? Um, don't ask, don't tell episode, that which was, was like one. relevant to the point. Yeah, really well done. Um, a very like genuine take on homosexuality. Um. And it was of the time because it was so relevant, but it 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 didn't feel contrived. It felt like, oh, this was happening. It's you know genuine. It's it's relevant, but it's not like, okay, this happened in the news three weeks ago, or uh, you know, obviously, <laughs> yeah. you know it didn't feel like that. I and, think it's just they added okay. extra breathing room, I guess, because those other shows are kind of based on what you're feeling in the moment, which kind of determines your enjoyment. Because there are plenty of ones where it's like, that was well acted and well written, but I didn't enjoy it personally. <laughs> and uh, yeah. with legal, you're kind of just, I guess you're just, there's enough, kind of like West Wing, you, there's enough comedy in between. You're able to just kind of get warmed up for 
it's kind of like if you're seeing live improv or poetry you're or even a speaker at your college you have enough that you're able to break through that barrier without like you say just feeling like hey then i just see that on a cnn report last week <laughs> you know, just, i uh, uh, but I, i've only encountered ever one person who thought that show just didn't oh maybe a few there was like some people who didn't think it held up as well and there was one person who felt it was preachy and i thought interesting because the main female writer kept saying i'm i try to avoid having it go on too long to avoid feeling preachy and it's like and i never felt like i was being preached to i mean when alan's complaining about the iraq war he's kind of just trying to make a bigger point instead of phrasing it as and here's how i feel versus here's how they feel he's just like he's just reading off stats and you know he's building up to a totally different side of his overall argument i think and i guess i guess like shrek this has layers like an onion <laughs> got a reference yeah i think <laughs> couldn't help it we, we know that um he's also trying to win the case so there's like he an is. element of like he's trying to also say the right thing to make his then point he like, plays he dirty can... by saying to the yeah, judge can... i'm gonna sleep with your wife and you're like what that's not gonna win you anything <laughs> he kind of also says what we're all thinking like the darker stuff the more morbid stuff he's yes. he's like kind of our yeah antagonistic like devil on our shoulder side and it's not like danny crane's the angel but he's the more pure i guess if you were going to do that like chart of like um i would say danny crane's like chaotic neutral um <laughs> you know, alan has that chaotic evil if he needs it it's in his back pocket yes <laughs> and so i love it plays with that concept a little bit oh my and God. <laughs> i don't know i like i like when characters are kind of gross and unsavory and An unlikable honest liar. yeah because we want that's how human beings are i'm going are. to stab you in the back but at least i'll warn you before i do it while Denny is kind of like still not learning from his mistakes, you get to season five and he's still twiddling his thumbs. And the judge is like, you don't seem to be involved in the case, sir. And he's like, oh, I, I'm just reenacting me being bored during history class, judge. <laughs> God damn it. Why are you a lawyer? How did you get this far? That's and like, yeah, there's a charm to that. That's like how <laughs> we are just ourselves and kind of simple and like a, a you know, kind of like a fifth grader again. Danny Crane is oh kind of like a, a child fifth grader. <laughs> One of my favorite podcasts I listen to is Who Would Win? And as a fun take on the whole just versus matches, uh, uh, Ray will spend, the if he's a former wrestler, will spend too much time trying to research YouTube clips while James just uses what he calls the intoxicating mind fog where he goes, and by the way, Ray, I didn't listen to anything you had to say because it wasn't interesting. And uh, here's how I feel about this character and that character. Here's why Spawn defeats this character in a fight. <laughs> here's why Jason Bourne is a pretty cool martial artist. Here's why Pinhead is going down because I'm repping this, you know, sci-fi fantasy horror character. <laughs> just like, I, and I just love that kind of whole sense of just be a python, just strike and, and let them know what are, when you bite them. What are the venoms, you know, striking into their blood instead of just using all the venting all this energy where you can't, where it's not needed? <laughs> yeah, it's like the ADHD kid response. <laughs> the honest one. <laughs> I know, because I always try to be more cerebral, and I sometimes you come across that in, in your in your life, just like you know, talking to people, and you're like, "Whoa, that threw me for a loop." Just someone saying, "I didn't listen to anything you said." I don't care now what and you're like wait what i'm a All, my fool whole because i didn't heart. see it yeah. coming <laughs> i thought i've seen everything <laughs> <There's something laughs> charming in that. yeah i'm envious of people that have that kind of you know single celledness for their like i'm yeah. happy now i'm sad now yeah i'm in there's a you're because essentially what that person's saying is i'm present in the moment because I'm always in my own brain thinking and I'm like rolling my, my brain scrolling. It's somewhere else. I'm thinking about my grocery list. You know, my brain's divided. <laughs> yeah. I can only always. spend this X I'm amount good. until this day when I get paid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm never fully present and I'm so envious of people that are like that. And so I think it's, you, to me, Denny Crane's the present one. He's in, <laughs> he's a hedonist. And Alan is the the mental scroller. He's like, how can I 
be the philosopher somewhere else mentally, you know, away. And, and he's also his own worst enemy. He's a self-sabotager. He destroys relationships. He does. Absolutely. He, yeah. What is it? The second episode, he is the guardian for his ex-girlfriend who tried to kill him. Oh and my God. It was Elizabeth that Mitchell. Happened? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and um, I, she was an ama- amazing in that too. And I was like, oh. you've seen her later on The Purge and The Expanse. She's kind of a sci-fi horror queen now. <laughs> yeah, man. I know. I need to like, get into that universe because I feel like so many good actors go into that space, and I just <laughs> in space. That's all. That's all yes, yeah, space literal and <laughs> figuratively. And um, and Jason went there, so can we. <laughs> I just don't, it's such a dedication going into like that, like the, uni- like learning about that, those, again, uh, literally and figuratively, the universes, uh, you know, <laughs> stars and that whole world. Um, and I just, I don't know, when I go into a show, I go deep. Like I like knowing about all the extra stuff around it and the history and the, a lot of I reason watch, to have um, to binge it instead of, okay, I guess this is going somewhere on sure. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, there's so much good. It makes me like sad that we only have so many years on this earth. Cause I'm like, there's so many good books to read, movies to watch, TV shows yeah. to watch. I'm like, how all in my short, short life? It's not fair. Um, but that's like my usual existential dread. I'm like, you know, we're all, we're all, <laughs> yeah, so much. Well, we're all trying to avoid all these stands and Karens. And then at the same time, it's like, uh Oh, I said something there that could be interpreted as such. Maybe I'm, risking becoming one of them so i better better wake up better <laughs> smell the roses <laughs> yeah tr- yeah and it's crazy too how in modern tv is such like a fandom like um like you were saying with like uh rick and morty and everyone being so intense and extreme about shows and all of that like i miss whenever it was just a show and people enjoyed it and were tuned in but like then you moved on you weren't like bickering with people. It's mm-hmm. like, why? It's it's good because it's teaching us things and it's yep. storytelling. It's like, why do we need to fight? It's supposed to be fun. We fight enough in our real lives. Yep. And so many, I miss even when it didn't matter if a show was a union or not. There were so many other shows from the 80s and 90s that did a good job having all this topical information and they were on a sister channel. So they, had enough ratings that they had enough freedom to do what they want anything from tells from the dark side to babylon 5 to all these other ones homicide uh life on the street uh launched a bunch of careers and that david simon guy was a former cop and he's done all these other social commentaries for hbo and it's like uh sometimes people can beat the whole ratings game and just find the right people at the right time but uh, i don't even know how anyone even just gives a chat on how to be influential (laughs) well i don't even it's funny because i was i wasn't sure how this show was rated and so i was i was reading little blurbs about like the ratings and and viewership and whatnot and i didn't realize that it bustle legal had not good ratings like it was a it was a it's an emmy's darling but it was not yeah it was not and I was surprised because I, for some reason in my mind, I thought, oh, it was more, you know, industry acclaimed than, you know, um, sort of like cult classic acclaimed. And it was the opposite. And I was surprised because it seems like it would have been a show that would have been so loved in like the, what was it, the Nielsen ratings world, that traditional <laughs> old school, you know, TV rating game. And I don't know, that just, it surprised me. And I, it made me realize like, oh, this show was, there was no guarantee it was going to go on as long no. as it did. <laughs> you know, especially I saw an interview with Lake Bell where she said that she was basically fired from the show when uh, Shirley fired her character, Sally. Like it was basically like that scene was like her also kind of being fired in real life because she ran into Candace Bergen in real life. And she was like, hey, remember when you fired me in the show? And it like took her for a loop. She was like, whoa, what? Because it was like kind of a sore subject. So I was like, wow, there was a, some animosity. They weren't quite sure of how this was going to work. They brought in so many new characters, new interns. And now she's kind an of indie a- filmmaking darling, you know? <laughs> and 
how, yeah, how the mighty evolved. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it ended up being good for her. And she had like that. And I could see too, because I don't know where else her character would have gone. Because it was like, how much can her and Alan play back and forth? They brought her back briefly become... and she had changed up. But they did a good job of saying, and by the way, she's moved on from all you guys. You guys are assholes. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it kind of fits too, because that, yeah, I have a friend that's a lawyer and he had to quit his one job at a legal firm recently because there was um a ton of sexual harassment chaos going on and so mm -hmm. he was telling me these stories and i'm like oh my god this really does happen like this is like the show is real like it's that level of partying and socializing and affairs mm -hmm. and bad flirting and i was surprised because yeah. i thought this was a little like over the top but i'm like he was telling me stories i'm like oh my god these could have been plot points in the show. Yeah, this could have been really no different than what Epstein or any of those other jerks were doing at the time. I think it's just kind of like police corruption and white supremacy and all other sorts of just very, very, you know, just, you know, with people taking out their anger from playing a video game. I think we just disguised so many issues or acted like it was only a certain demographic and, you know. However, I guess we were stating it, it just wasn't getting through and we were just hiding behind our pride. <laughs> oh, but it only happens to that person. Or, oh, let's slut shame this person or act like they're they're asking for it. And it's like, well, no victim asked for it. So <laughs> if it happened, yeah. there's a reason it happened. It didn't just happen overnight either. <laughs> and oh. I think the show does a good job showing that the legal system caters to wealthy people caters yes. to people that know about how to wiggle through the legal system mm -hmm. and that's why law was so unappealing to me as i went through my political science degree because <laughs> i was like it's just rich people manipulation it's just mm -hmm. gross it's pretty yeah, it's, much and, who has the bigger stones so to speak versus who has yeah. actual material to detail you can even do a good and, job and still get denied if the judge is a i mean there was this one recent judge uh, who took out his cell phone? I think it was during, not not Zimmerman, uh, uh, Rittenhouse. Uh, just uh, his hack lawyer decided, hey, I'm gonna just go to this racist judge, and the judge actually had his cell phone go off during the whole deal, and it was just like, <laughs> but this was all deliberate. He knew he was gonna pretty much get a mistrial or just get an easy win, just because. Whoever, you know, and I think with the Clarence Thomas scandal and other stuff of recent, I think we are having to just rem remind other people is like, you can be in a big place of power, but, you know, even with Cuomo and, you know, various district attorney scandals is like, you always hold everyone in question uh, under a microscope. It does not matter how they got there. And, you know, you can get there through, you know, unofficial means that weren't you know, valid. And you just got to kind of just take a step back and just put it in focus. <laughs> yeah, we're also working within the parameters. The biggest thing for me, another thing that made me un, uninterested in the legal profession was you're working with a, to me, a flawed document. The Constitution yes, is systematic. Sort of flawed document. <laughs> and um it hasn't been updated. It hasn't been upgraded. It hasn't been layered or nuanced. It's and like doing your try to update it. It pretty much is there to serve a political side. And it's like, no, uh -uh, uh -uh. if we're going to update it, it and has to be to improve it. <laughs> exactly. And it has to be, um, you know, it's sort of like working with the Bible to be to be dictating your whole life. Is it's we're we've come up with some cooler books since then. You know, maybe like. The Hobbits, the next version to me, the the higher version of the, of the Bible. It's like then maybe you know you're working with an upgrade. Or I recently was thinking, I'm like, when it comes to the Constitution, you know, we had in there for a while that basically black people were three fifths white people. I mean, that was in that document. So it's like America's never really gone to therapy in a way. We've never worked or dealt with our stuff before, and so if you're working in that kind of like kind of muck and if you're using that document to dictate things 
it's the system is never going to be fair for people and it's kind of like a futile endeavor and that's mm, sort of how very I saw futile it. yeah and yeah so that was another thing where I'm like I get why people want to be lawyers I get that people can do good in the system but I don't think my it's value amazing is, man <laughs> yeah yeah I don't think my value in society will come from and it it isn't and it won't from working in the legal profession. Now, can I love a good closing statement? Of oh, course. Yes. <laughs> like that's why I love the show where I'm like, oh, these I mean, again, like it gives me chills. I'm like, I get jealous about this writing. But I think it's more the content of what's being said than the legal profession is what draws me to the show now and draws me to that world and fascinates me because I think now, especially with like you know our world podcasting it's you know turning the curtain back instead of just playing with you know hey we're showing you this side of the formula which you've already seen and we're running out of steam slowly and i see people bitch about later seasons but honestly i think they i think a five-year run was the best way to do it I, instead of all these other ones which just go on and on and on until there's virtually nothing to tell anymore <laughs> Yeah, it's either shows go for now one season and then they're done or yeah, like you said, forever and ever and ever and ever. And it's like once something is the once the ball is rolling and it never stops it, the thing it started as it it ceases to be, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like an avalanche, you know, we wanted it to be a small snowball, but now it's become this this kind of monstrous thing that has no (laughs) tangible thing to it. (laughs) Taking you over. It's a parasite. Yeah, it's like exactly. And it's like, yeah, like that's how I feel about the modern because Law and Order SVU was like one of my favorite shows. And what it's become now is like it's just there. It has no point of view. It has no <laughs> really like, whatever. It's just fine. I mean, it's I'll watch it if it's on TV. And did I love one Hard of the Hard. did you see one of the more recent ones? I haven't no, because it bums they me. They reopened out. a it, bunch, like, they reopened a bunch of newer cases that Basically, all of them are mistrials now, so they've been doing more serialized oh. shit. But yeah, they did have some filler shit for a while that went bananas. I just appreciate all the crossovers with bringing the main show back, which I was always a bigger fan of, just because crime solving, legal case, and then final statement. I just always like the free act structure there. But I know they're going to bring Criminal Intent back, and having Stabler's Manhunt has been kind of, I thought, a step in the right direction, but uh that there's stuff for all shows to grow there's plenty of other ones which you know flew the coop years ago i I always i think sean ryan's still kind of one of the single best writers because you might know him from stuff like the shield and a few other just gritty shows Uh, he has the night agent on netflix now but he has every season always speak for itself so he was always able to combat cancellation and i think everyone just keeps running into it I, i see so many of them who just shrug saying who cares i'm like oh dude we want you to revisit those characters that you freshly brought to life. Uh, you see other ones too, who are just kind of out of it. And I'm like, ah, dude, <laughs> you blew my mind back in the day. You should pat yourself on the back. Cause no one else can do that. Yeah. It's almost like you have to have a really good sense. Whenever a show is like this, you have to have like a, a thermometer <laughs> of saying like, yeah, like, okay sometimes you have to leave some things to some characters to kind of like be mysterious still never quite finish their story to kind of give that lingering feeling but then close some stories and it's almost like you like uh like being alive like being a human some things end nice and neatly some things linger some doors stay open and I think you have to find that delicate balance and if you don't and everything closes nice and neatly or everything stays open it just feels unsettled. It doesn't feel good. It, and so, again, I think it's just the uh, the a luck. It has to be, you know, timing plus character choice plus writing to really create these magical shows. And I'm curious to see with the, the writer strike, obviously, has been agreed upon, but the actor strike is continuing. They canceled <sighs> or they stopped negotiations. So I'm curious if things are going to change. If we're going to migrate to the old school way of writing and creating shows or if it's going to keep going toward this kind of consumerism tiktok like quibby <laughs> yes. 
And then there's going to be 50 other apps that replace the ones we're using now. That's going to be mind blowing. What are they going to do that's different, that offers more than the other brand? You know, and you're like, whoa. Yeah. I see. And I was just listening to an interview with Theo Vaughn and um, Anthony Jeselnik, comedians. And um, <laughs> I love those Jeselnik, yeah. One of them was talking about going to the last blockbuster, which is in Bend, Oregon. And they were oh, saying how God. nice it is to physically have a tangible movie. And it's not an algorithm choosing for you anymore. It's you choosing what you want. And I was like, I miss that feeling so much of tangible, analog, old school, choosing, flipping on the TV, like going through channels. I think we're going to go to a renaissance of, like they're saying streaming is dying. I think we're going to just go back to cable. I think we're just going to be like, <laughs> we're because we learned the internet's trash. Like the algorithms are trash, the life's trash. Maybe I'm optimistic and like old fashioned, maybe like a caveman and I can't see the future, but we're definitely not saving money like they thought they would. (laughs) No, they're hemorrhaging money. They're well, it's also over leveraged and they it's all stocks and blah blah blah. But yeah, I'm also very old school. Like I listen to records, I collect records, I have a record player. Like I like everything old fashioned. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm one of those people. So I could be totally wrong, but I'm hoping we'll go back to the old world. (laughs) The old world. Open. You want to do a plug for happiest said person real fast before we go? I got to jump on another interview and follow this. Yeah, totally. <laughs> this has been great you on. No. Back. Um, so I could, I, I just love jabbering. I, my, one of my talents is running uh, my mouth. That's why um, we like yes. doing this show. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a treat. Um, if you want to hear me run my mouth elsewhere, you can join me at the happiest sad person podcast. Um, I have new episodes in the can i'm releasing some after a, a long hiatus my book will be coming out soon hopefully in Ooh. january 2024 death in the time of suburbia will be the book um yeah find me at the happy sad person podcast on instagram that's kind of where you can find me whoop, whoop. and yeah this has been wonderful anytime you that you rocked it yeah all Come right thank you we'll keep thinking of some other stuff to talk about hell we can even just talk about books <laughs> I would love, I'm down, whatever. Yeah, we have in common. Want to promote your book when the time comes. We can do that too. Just perfect. Keep prospering. I'm feeling optimistic. So your optimism is rubbing off. Yeah, optimistic nihilist. (laughs) We're all just babies without a babysitter. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, who needs a babysitter when we can't even get along with our damn babysitter? (laughs) Exactly. Right? Keep kicking ass on the wild side. Talk soon. You as well. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a jacked up.